Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to this webinar organized by Eglatai, Eglatai Academy. And um, it's our absolute pleasure to, uh, to present to you some thoughts, some information, some practical um, tools around squirrel lens fitting. My name is Arnold Stepfangers. I'm general manager of, uh, of Eaglet Eye, and uh, I will be uh, kicking off today and, uh, and doing a quick uh, introduction. And then uh, we'll quickly switch to Ilse Flux. She is the optometrist, or one of the optometrists uh, working at Eaglet Eye, uh, responsible for um, professional affairs and uh, doing a lot of uh, specialty lens fits, including a lot of uh, squirrel lens fits. And then um, it's such a pleasure to have uh, Kian Gildi, um, our customer from Ireland. And um, he's been working with our device for, uh, for quite some time now and uh, has been fitting a lot of scleral lenses. And he is going to share some, uh, some practical uh, cases that he's fitted and, um, and explain how he uh, managed to, uh, to come to, uh, to successful fits. Um, just a few remarks. Um, you'll see a, a chat box uh, on your browser. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions there. Um, um, the one who's not presenting, the others will, uh, will actually uh, pay attention to that and will try to, uh, to respond immediately. Hi, Kiriakos. Good evening. How are you? Good to see you. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started. Scleral lenses have been around for, uh, for centuries. Um, they were first mentioned by Leonardo da Vinci. And um, so, um, and it's, 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 it's been kind of around early in the 20th century. There were um, blown glass uh, spheres made as, um, as, um, as scleral lenses. And, uh, but it was, it was not until the, that's what we call the big revolution of scleral lenses by the, by the four musketeers, uh, Don Ezekiel from Australia, Rince Fisser from here in Holland, uh, Ken Pullum in the UK and uh, Perry Rosenthal in, in the US, that um, the whole concept, of course, also driven by new materials that came to the market, uh, but new designs uh, that lifted the whole scleral lens field to to a next level, and um, and um, uh, with with all the recent developments, it's it's really accelerated the um, the new innovations around this modality of, of lenses, and both um, Ilse and and Kian will uh, will talk more about that later. Um, Another revolution that we'd like to draw your attention to is the profilometry revolution. And, um, and of course, in, in our vision, just as the four musketeers did with lens designs, um, so we believe that um, profilometry will actually revolutionize the whole fitting process. So a quick introduction into this technology. Um, and. Um, there's a couple of features. It measures up to 20 millimeters, both in horizontal and vertical, um, about half a million data points. And it does so also for the cornea at a very high accuracy. So two microns for the cornea and about 10 microns for the, for the sclera. And because it can do both, um, it's a technology that allows you to fit um, corneal lenses as well. So both ortho-K and RGP but also soft, hybrid, and, uh, and of course, scleral lenses are subject for today. Um, at Eaglet Eye, we have made a strategic decision to stay lab independent. And currently, there are about 35 lenses integrated from about 18 labs. But we have an open door policy, so we will work with any lab willing to work with us. And so we keep on pushing that and keep on expanding more lenses so that you in your practice have more choice and uh, and with that choice of course you can basically find the best fitting lens for every type of eye 
So profilometry can offer you, and this has been, um, been shown in a retrospective study done in collaboration with um, Brian Tompkins in the UK, 85% um, first lens fit success rate. So he did a, a retrospective study where for 49 eyes that were fitted in, the scleral lenses were fitted in the old fashioned way with a fitting set. Um, he had um, refits between two and seven with an average of three point something. And so all of these patients were re-invited to his practice and they were measured with the eye surface profiler. The algorithm fitting, the scleral lens fitting algorithm was run for that particular measurement. And in 85% of the times it pointed to the final best fitting lens that was selected through the much more lengthy old fashioned method. So as a consequence, one of the big value points for profilometry is that it can reduce the total time per patient. So the initial measurement might take a bit longer than you're used to, but because you can uh, forego, you can prevent refits, your total time per patient will re be reduced significantly. You will have better, better patient outcomes, um, you will be able to make informed, data-driven decisions on the customization of lenses. And uh, well, and here with, uh, with three optometrists on board, and um, we have a, a very keen team that will help you make a, make a flying start with the device. So profilometry basically is a single shot measurement system where you first instill fluorescein onto the tear film. This is absolutely necessary because the sclera or the conjunctiva, if you want, is actually non-reflective. So if you want to get an image, not just from the cornea, but out to the sclera, you need something there. And that something is the fluorescein. So when you hit that with cobalt blue light, then the fluorescein mole molecules will scatter back the light in all directions. And, um, and you see that, yeah, I hope you can see that on your screen, um, a line, vertical line pattern that is projected um, is, is, is then formed because of fluorescein molecules. These two photos are then um, processed, first individually, and then uh, they're meshed together and it will give you a 3D point cloud that, that very precisely describes the, the front surface of the eye. And this then is the basis for any lens fitting, including serial lens fittings. This is a, a study done by, by Jerry Ledgerton in the US with profilometry technology. Um, he measured um, uh, a, a whole host of, of eyes and, and what you see on this graph here is, is the variation in sagittal depth. And just to illustrate the, the, the great variety of, of sagittal depths that there are with, with, uh, with eyes, uh, we drew this red cord line of 14 millimeters. And you can see that between the, the flattest, shallowest eyes and the steepest, deepest eyes, there is a, a difference of three millimeters. So it really, if you're going to fit a scleral lens, you have to measure. Um, it, the differences are such that uh, just by trial and error with a fitting set, it will take so much more time. There's been a lot of um, research. We, uh, we pride ourselves on supporting a lot of research projects. There's about 17 uh, peer-reviewed papers published at this moment. I just want to light, uh, hi uh, highlight a few. Of course, Rob Iskander um, is, is one of the first because uh, Rob in the past used to develop all the algorithms for the Medmont and we have been so happy and lucky that, um, that he's been working for us with us for um, uh, the last seven years developing our algorithm and also developing our image processing algorithms. And he, he's been at the basis for a good number of, um, of publications around scleral shape, around the accuracy of our device. And, uh, and also Alejandra Consejo from Spain. Um, she's been doing a lot of interesting work, publications around the effects of, um, of soft lenses, the effect of scleral lenses 
um, on the on the actual surface of the eye. So she took uh, a measurement uh, without the lens, and then right after the lens was worn for a considerable time, and then took the difference maps and basically shown how much of an influence the uh, the lens pressure has on the on the surface of the eye. Um, David Pinheiro, absolutely, she's come with some very interesting work on how keratoconus actually will shift the, the location of the limbus and, and has surface effects that go well beyond the cornea. Um, so um, if, if you want to have more information of any of these publications, please contact us and uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to provide you with that. Um, okay, let's uh, move on. So, we openly invite you to become the next scleral lens leader and, um, and, 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 and use technology to, to be unique, to upserve, to specialize, and most of all, to charge proper fees for the work that you do. And uh, a big word of congratulations out to Brian Tompkins, mentioned before, uh, this Friday, he won in the UK, he won uh, a big prize for the, the best technology practice optometry practice in the UK and, um, and and the points that I note that I note here on this on this screen are absolutely his points he's living and breathing that and he's using technology and not just our machine but also an OCT he's got all kinds of other technology to raise the the level of uh, of service of, of eye care that he can provide and uh, and he's not sh shy to charge for that. So um, he's uh, he's really a, a great example for all of us. So we are uh, at the end of, of my introduction. So it's my pleasure now to uh, to switch over to to Ilse. Give us a few seconds to uh, to to make that happen, and then uh, she'll continue where I left off. So everybody should be able to hear me right now. Let's see if I can start up my slideshow for you. There you go. Uh, hopefully the screen is visible for everybody since we're having some issues earlier. If not, just give us a quick shout in the chat and we'll try to fix it as quick as possible. Uh, so first of all, good evening everybody or good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar. And hopefully you are still full of energy for those of you who've had a long day of work already. Um, Arno just did a brief introduction on the history of scleral lenses and the techno technology of the eye surface profiler. Um, so it's up to me to explain a bit more on the fitting process of scleral lenses. Of course, it's Monday evening, so we try to make it as informative as possible without taking up too much of your time. Um, if I'm going too fast at any time, or if something is unclear, please just drop your question in the chat. And I uh, will happily explain everything again. Uh, somebody's asking me to talk a little bit louder. I have a microphone attached, which I'm pulling up a little bit higher now. So hopefully you can hear me a little bit better. And otherwise, I can only say, please up the volume of your PC. Um, just to give a really short introduction of myself, I'm Ilse Flux, I'm a Dutch optometrist. I finished my bachelor degree in Utrecht in 2016. After I finished my bachelor, I, I, I just felt like there was more in optometry to do um, and more to learn. So I did a research master um, in Scotland. So I got my MSc degree in Scotland in Glasgow. So if you wonder why I have this really weird accent, now you know. And I'm currently working for Eagled Eye where I help customers with scleral lens fitting uh, based on a daily basis. So what I wanna go over today is mostly the fitting and lens design and fitting scleral lenses based on sagittal, uh, on, a, on a height profile, so on sagittal height. After that, Kian, he will go over some examples and explain a little bit more of his journey with scleral lenses. I do want to point out that we're really going over the basics today. So for the more advanced fitters that are listening right now as well, 
You guys are awesome. We're hoping to plan a more advanced scleral lens fitting webinar soon, uh, but for now we're just going to do the basics. Um, so before we start with examples and lens fittings, I'm just going back to the beginning. Um, in this presentation, when we talk about scleral lenses, we try to get away from radius or curvature values, but we really want to talk about sagittal height. So height or sagittal height is expressed in microns. 1,000 microns equals one millimeter. I think the most familiar example that we know is the cornea. We know that the average cornea is in between 500 and 550 microns, which equals 0 0.5 millimeters. So the OCT image that's visualized here is illustrating height. Um, this is a normal eye fitted with a scleral lens. So the first section that you can see up here, that's the cornea, which has a thickness of approximately 500 microns. The black layer here in the middle, that's a tear film. That is a tear film layer in between the lens and the cornea, which is about 270 micron thick. And up top of this, there is a scleral lens. Uh, dependent on the manufacturer, a lens can be anywhere between 350 or 900 microns thick. Um, as you can see, this one is about the same size of the cornea. So it's also estimated at 500 microns. Um, to determine the sagittal height of the eye, we need to draw a line. It's called a chord line. Uh, this is a line that marks from which point we are going to measure the sagittal height of the eye. This line will be codependent based on the diameter of the lens you use. For example, if you work with a smaller RGP lens, uh, then it's most relevant to determine the height of the eye at around a 9.8 millimeter chord length which you can see in the image over here. When using a soft lens, it's most common to use a 14.2 millimeter cord length. And when we work with scleral lenses, the cord length used mostly is equal to the diameter of the lens. Uh, for the ease of this presentation, I'm gonna use a 17 millimeter cord length, as you can see in this image. Um, this, of course, doesn't mean that every scleral lens has a diameter of 70 millimeters. It can be anywhere between 15 and 22. Um, just for the reference, I'm using 17 millimeters right now. So are, there are different methods to measure the height of the eye. Uh, of course, a machine everybody knows very well is the Pentacam. Um, they, have, they have a reach of approximately 20 millimeters wide. Uh, so if they want to measure the sagittal height of, let's say, a 17 millimeter lens, they still need to extrapolate data. Another method to measure sagittal height is based on the regular corneal topographer that you guys probably all have in practice. Uh, however, these machines, they measure radius and curvature, so they do not measure sagittal height directly. So what we need to do based on based on the radius and curvature values, we calculate the first tangent angle, which you can see up here. From that point on, we draw a line below, and then we can calculate a larger sagittal height. Uh, this method is actually quite complicated and asks for some knowledge, so it's pretty easy to, mistake, uh, to make mistakes or to not have accurate data, because it's still an extrapolation calculation that we're making and it's not measuring exact sagittal height. The other method has Arnaud previously described. Um, it's called profilometry, which can measure 20 millimeters wide and is exact sagittal height data. Let's see if we can get the next slide. Um, so before we actually start fitting scleral lenses, we of course wanna know a little bit more about the lens design. Um, so this design that you see up here is a Bausch & Lomb Zen lens, uh, which I'm using for reference right now because they've got this really nice image online. Um, so they use four zones in their lens. The first one being the central fold. The second one being the mid peripheral clearance area. The third one is the limbal clearance. And the fourth one is the scleral alignment. Scleral lenses currently have 
three to five zones. Um, this has something to do with the built-in smart curve that some lenses have and others don't. Um, or the manufacturer chose to add an extra curve here at the end at the scleral alignment zone. That's why the curves, the number of curves differ per lens design that you're using. Uh, but in this case, this lens has four curves. Um, so first off, the central vault. It's the first central zone of a lens. And this is the area which is faulting over the cornea. So you do not want it to touch the cornea, but you want it to vault over. So that's this first little part here. The second area is the mid-peripheral clearance. Um, this zone is also called a smart curve, which is an extra curve created in the lens, which simplifies the fitting process of a lens. This curve makes it possible that independent of the rest of the central lens or other parameters in the lens, the volt can be changed independent. So you can change the volt in this case, independent to the rest of the parameters. I'll have you a little example. Uh, for instance, if you want to increase the central sagittal height, so the central zone, what's going to happen with the rest of the lens is that it's going to become tighter. So you're going to have a more tight fit. Because we have that smart curve over here, which adapts to the, the changes you are making, you'll see that the rest of the landing zone stays the same. So that's the purpose of the smart curve, which they have in the Zen lens design over here. I hope that's clear. If I was going a little bit too fast, please ask a question on this. Um, so the other zones we have available are the limbal clearance area, which is up here. Uh, this is very simple. This is to make sure that there is a lift around that limbal area and it's not pressuring down. And then the last area is the scleral alignment, uh, which is also called landing zone. And this is basically how well, how well the lens is aligning with the sclera. Um, So this, this section, this clear alignment zone, will become larger if you use a larger diameter lens. It's a little bit smaller when you use a smaller diameter lens. All right, so, so far into this webinar, I've been just saying all kinds of terminology and all kinds of difficult words. So just to give you a very quick overview of what I've been saying to you guys. Uh, a cord line is a location in the anterior eye on which the sagittal height has been measured. Sagittal height is basically the height of the eye. Uh, the central fold is the central height of the scleral lens. Um, central clearance is the tear film in between the eye and the scleral lens. It's what we've seen in that first OCT image. Mostly this value is 250 micron. And then we have the limbal clearance or the limbal clearance area in a lens, which is the area in between the limbus and the scleral lens. We also have a landing zone available in a lens, uh, which is the location of the first point of touch of the sclera and the alignment with the rest of the ocular surface. And at last but not least, we've got scleral toricity or scleral astigmatism. Um, I will explain a bit more on this matter in my next slide. But just to simplify it really quickly, uh, it's the difference between two meridians. Um, between two meridians in the sclera, just, just like you have corneal toricity, you can have scleral toricity as well. I'm going to do a quick explanation right now. Oh, I see my image was getting lost right there. Uh, I'm just going to do a, a quick explanation on how a sagittal height map works. So what we basically do is we measure a best fit sphere. So over here in the image on the right hand side, you can see a green dotted line over here, which is the line of the cornea. And you can see an orange dotted line, which is the line over here, which is the sclera. So the orange dotted line and the green dotted line, so the line of the cornea and the sclera, they're pasted together into one best fit sphere which is the blue line that you see over here. So that's a best fit sphere map created by the cornea and the sclera together. Everything that's above that best fit sphere, like these three points over here, is marked in red. So that's an elevation. So in the image above, everything that's on top, so that's red means it's higher, means it's elevated. Everything that is blue, 
which is lower, is below the best fit sphere. So it's underneath that marked line that we have over here. And we also have the yellow points. They lay exactly on top of the best fit sphere. So that's kind of marked as a zero elevation. So just quickly, everything that's red is more higher. Everything that's blue means it's lower, it's depressed, and everything that's yellowish is on the same line as the best fit sphere. <clears throat> Hopefully this is clear for everybody. Um, I want to move over to our live software just to give you some examples. I can see there's another image showing up here. There's a red line here. Uh, I forgot to tell you this. So why I've draw this, drawn this red line up here is because you can see there's an elevation on this end and an elevation over here. If we move on, we see it's more blue there and more blue over here. And this is the scleral tericity I was previously talking about. So you can see distinguished red coloring in one meridian of the sclera and a more blue coloring in another meridian of the sclera. Uh, I have another example of this. So I'm going to go out of my PowerPoint right now and I'm going to go over some examples which you should be able to see at your screen right now. So this is a normal eye. This is an eye of a normal patient, no diseases. Uh, and this is what you'd expect to see when you take a height map of a non-diseased eye. So there are a couple of things when we look at. First off, we want to know how wide is this image taken? So we can see that up here, we've got a 10 millimeter wide image horizontally and vertically. So we did a good job taking the measurement. So then the next thing we want to do is we want to fit a scleral lens on here. So if I look at the sclera up here, I can see it's pretty much the same coloring. So expect that when I fit a lens on this guy, it will be a spherical landing zone. So it's not going to have tericity in it because it all has the same color. And the other thing, of course, that I want to know is what sagittal height do I need to get? How high do I need my lens to be? So you can make it really easy to yourself. Into the software, we have all kinds of lens algorithms, which is underneath the first lens fit button over here. Oh, let's see if it's working. There you go. And we're going to go for the Bausch and Lomb Zen lens since I was using that as an example earlier on. And we can calculate the lens for you guys. So this system is currently running on the Wi-Fi and it's going to load as fast as your Wi-Fi is. So there it is. So as you can see, it's suggesting flat zero in steep two. That is about 30 to 60 steps of corneal toricity in the landing zone. So that's, that's not as much. That's basically spherical. And the other thing we're getting from here is the fault. So it's saying to get a lens of 5,150 microns. I can check that myself. Over here, I've got a sagittal height calculator. If I type in 17, the sagittal height of this eye will show up, which is 360 degrees. If we're going to get a lens and put a lens on this guy of 4,900 sagittal height, it's going to stick on top of that cornea. So that's not what we want. We don't want to take a lens that has the exact same sagittal height. What I want to do is I want to add around 200, 250 microns for the clearance and the settling of the lens. So that's how we get that higher number of 5,150 up here. Does it make sense for everybody why this number over here is higher than the actual sagittal height? If you've got any questions about this, again, just ask them in the chat. If you do not want to use a 17 diameter lens in this case, but you want to use a 16, you can just go over here, change the algorithm, and it's going to make the same calculation for a diameter 16 lens. So in this case, we type in a chord length of 16, because we're using a 16 lens. And you can see right now, it's suggesting a perfectly spherical lens. And again, it's adding around 250, 300 microns 
to that average height of the eye. All right, so this was a normal eye. I'm gonna make it a little bit more complicated for you guys. So over here, I have an example of a more toric eye. The way we can recognize that is that because over here, it's more blue, and on this side, we can see it's more red. So over here, it's more elevated, and up here, it's more blue. I can see you guys thinking, okay, it's fun, it's toric, but how much toricity does this eye have? Because when I start fitting a scleral lens and I want to change those landing zones, I need to know how much toricity it is. So again, depending on what lens you want to fit, if it's a 17 diameter or a 16 diameter lens, we can calculate that. So for this example, I'm just going to use a Zen lens again. And I'm going to type in the cord length of 16 over here. Now I'm not just going to look at the 360 sagittal height, but I'm also interested in the minimum and the maximum sagittal height which is the lowest and the highest point of the sclera. If I take the difference between these two values, I notice that this patient has approximately 500 microns of tericity. I'm just gonna wait for the lens algorithm to load up. Um, like I said earlier, it's working over Wi-Fi, so this can take a little bit of time. There you go. And I can see that it is suggesting in the algorithm as well two different toricities. So keep in mind every step when using a Zen lens is 30 microns. So this is suggesting flat five, steep six, which is 11 steps. So right now it's estimating a toricity of around 350 microns for this eye, which makes sense we can see there's a lot of toricity present as here present here as well the other thing that we're curious at is that central volt that it's suggesting which is 4200 if we look over here it has been calculated higher than the actual sagittal height of the eye which is exactly what we expect uh, so we've had a normal eye right now and we've had an eye with a very toric sclera I want to go over one last example, which is patients, which is a patient that you guys are probably mostly fitting, um, which is a carotid conic patient. And the way we know this is a cone is because there is a very uh, yeah, pronounced red elevation over here in the middle. If I move my mouse all the way on top of here, I can see that this cone is approximately 250 microns high. So that's a pretty high elevation. Uh, so for this eye, it's extra convenient to know the sagittal height because we probably need a little bit higher sagittal height than average. So again, depending on the lens you want to use, you can type in the cord length. Let's go for 16 this time. And we can see the sagittal height of this eye is 4,350. So I'm estimating that if I use a 16 diameter lens, the suggestion of the software is at least going to be 4,500 micron. So to do so, we're just going to check that lens algorithm again to give me a suggestion what kind of lens I need to be fitting. All right, so we set 4,350 up here, and we can see again that's a little bit higher. It's also suggesting a little bit of toricity. Because there's that difference between this area and that area up here. Um, as you can see, we do not just have Zenlen 16 in here, but we've got all kinds of different designs. If you're interested, but that's a little bit more advanced fitting, we could even go for a quadrant specific lens.
In that case, it's going to suggest four meridians. Since we are measuring the sclera as well, uh, we can also notice abnormalities on the sclera. So I've got a last example here that I'm not going to go over a, a full lens fit, um, but this one is just here to show. Over here, we've got a marked red elevation, uh, which is a pink wecula. So if you're getting a little bit more into the advanced scleral fittings, um, you can measure your pink wecula here. You know the height, you know the size, and you know the location. And Brian, if you're really interested in a quad, quadrant-specific lens fit, we'll, we'll be able to help you out for that. Um, which was just a, a question in the chat. Um, so yeah, so this is basically a pink wecula. You see a marked, a red marked elevation on the sclera. If you get a little bit more experienced in scleral fitting, you can easily create a notch. All right, so those were all my examples. Um, hopefully it has been clear so far. If any questions come up after we finish this webinar, don't hesitate um, to just send us an email after. So I'm going to give the screen over to Kian right now. I'm going to see if I can get his presentation up. And then I will stop talking and, uh, and let Kian uh, do the word. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to this uh, presentation. And I hope you've been enjoying yourselves so far. Uh, my name is Kean, and um, I'm working in the Wellington Eye Clinic in Dublin. So just a little bit about myself. I did my undergraduate in Dublin Institute of Technology, um, and I had the opportunity to spend six months in the University of Houston College of Optometry finishing my degree. So um, I got some good experience in, in sclera lenses over there. If we just go on to the next um, slide, Ilsa. So, the I be I began fitting keratoconic patients in the Wellington, and I was mainly using the Rose K lens, and I was just getting extremely frustrated with um, very very difficult lens fits and varying degrees of vision. When you get a, a, a sharp nipple cone, trying to balance a, a small diameter GP lens and it was quite difficult. So I started looking further afield and um, that's where I became, or where I started looking into sclera lenses. And I started off with the ICD, the 16.5 and, and the Comfort 15 lenses. But there's just some limitations to those lenses. The, the vision, and the comfort reported by the patients is absolutely excellent. Um, but the limitations of the ICD, the 16.5 that I found was that that only has a, a built in tericity of 250 microns and um, that was fixed. You couldn't change that at all. And the comfort 15 had no um, uh, tericity in the landing zone at all. And there's been studies done that have shown that the average Tericity at 15 millimeters of the in the sclera is 1.5 diopters, and when you go out to 18 millimeter, that's that increases to five diopters. So that's where I found the ESP coming in um, massively to help. I was putting eye, I was putting contact lenses on eyes, and it was very very frustrating for patients as well. You know, they could be new to um, lens fitting. And when you're working off a diagnostic set and you're putting on countless uh, lenses, it's quite frustrating for you as a practitioner, but then also for the patient. So I, I, I thought that there had to be something out there to help streamline the, the process, and that's where the, the ESP comes in. And if we just go on again there, Ilse. Now, so a couple of, couple of case studies here. So the first patient uh, that I have here is a 17-year-old. Um, he was 
let's see here. Sorry, I'm just getting this up on my screen. So he was, you can see his prescription there. Um, he was diagnosed with bilateral keratoconus, uh, grade one in the right eye and grade three in the left. And um, he had cross-linking in our clinic um, in November. He had epi on cross-linking on the, on the right eye and epi off in the left due to, again, the severity of it. So we usually allow about six months after cross-linking for the patients to settle before we'll fit them in lenses. So if we go on to the next slide. So um, the, first, the first lenses that um, I actually fit were just some custom soft lenses. Um, and you can see he got a vision of 612 and 615. And he was, he was happy enough at the time, but then he came back to the clinic wondering if there was anything else, um, any way that we could improve the vision. If we just go on again. So again, this is where I come in with the Zen lens. Um, I think the Zen lens is, is fantastic and works very, very well because of the amount that you can change. But like Ilsa said earlier on, when you make a change to any of the parameters in this, with this lens, all the other parameters are unaffected. So take the ICD 16.5, for instance, if, you're, if you change anything in the limbal zone, it's going to affect the sag. If you change anything in the peripheral zone, it's going to affect the sag. So um, that's where the Zen lens really, really helps. So it comes in two diameters, a 16 mil and a 17 mil, um, and two different designs. So a prolate for keratoconics and an oblate design then for um, your post graft. Uh, pellucid patients and things like that and again you have a huge amount of um, availability to, to to modify the landing zone as well so and again comes in a quadrant specific design so you can really try and get the best fit that you could possibly um, get for the patient and again when you have the ESP and you're able to map exactly which areas of the sclera are steep, which are, which are flat, it's, it's an invaluable tool. And if you go on again, Ilsa. So um, there's the, the, you can see his, you can see the, the cone, but the one thing about the ESP that that again it works very very well is is giving you that initial sag so it gives you an idea of which a very accurate idea of which lens am i going to start with in terms of the sag and then again looking at this eye here you can see um the amount of tericity in it with the uh with the steeper areas at at about 90 um uh, 90 degrees there so place a toric lens on the eye as opposed to putting in, if you're fitting this with a with a diagnostic trial set, you'd be you'd be going on trying to establish the sag first. That could take you maybe two or three lenses, and then you'd be looking at the peripheral fit and wondering, okay, is this going to need a tarc or not? Whereas this, looking at this, you know exactly what the sag is going to be, and you know you're you're going to look when you put the lens on the eye, you'll know where to look for areas of um, lift and areas of compression. And if you go on again. So here is an OCT image of, um, of, that, of that lens on the eye. So I was, I was quite happy with it. And um, again, you could see here that was it after, after settling. So the central clearance was good. Um, but if you just look over there on the right hand side of the picture, I wasn't too happy with uh, the limbal clearance um, there on the on the right hand side. So what I did was I adjusted the limbal zone. I added 50 um, uh, microns to it. And then if we go on again, we'll just look here at the peripheral fit. So the the esp it suggested 270 microns of um tericity 
whereas the in the Zen lens, the diagnostic um, lens, there's about 100, 180 microns. So you can see here it shows pretty good alignment. So it's obeying the the 50-50 rule. So what the what that is is you just want about 50% of the lens over the con over the landing zone, the conjunctiva, and 50 below. And then if we go on to the next slide. We can see here that there's a little bit more lift there, so it's not a not a not as aligned as I would have liked. So what we did then was the final lens that we ordered. If we go on again, the final lens that we ordered then. So steep two and steep nine gives us the touristy that we wanted, uh, a 70 millimeter prolate and uh, a sag of 4,800. So one of the one of the other great things about the Zen lens is, and as suggested by the ESP, is that you can modify the base curve. So we took away, we flattened the base curve um, to adjust for some of uh, to to keep the the minus power um, a little bit lower. So the final lens prescription was a minus three, and the best corrected was six seven five plus. So the patient was very very happy. And if we look on again. Here's a picture of the lens on the eye um, in all directions of gaze there. So everything there was, was looking quite good. Now, um, so this is a picture of one month follow-up. So you can see that the, uh, the central clearance there is probably about between 100, 150 microns, which is what you want, and then the, the, the um, peripheral uh, area is well aligned with the uh, with the conjunctiva. Yeah, so the second case is a twenty five year old male. Um, again, that's his prescription. There, you can see the right eye was still correcting to six seven five, and the left eye was only correcting to six twenty. Again, with most of our keratoconic patients, we'll will note uh, a history of eye rubbing. So he was diagnosed with bilateral keratoconus, grade one in the one plus in the right and three plus in the left. Um, so he was he was followed up after three months and he was showing no progression. So he was sent to me then for a contact lens fit. So again, as opposed to going through the rigmarole of fitting through a diagnostic setting, uh, diagnostic fitting set, you get them on the ESP, and you know you're going to have a much more accurate fit so again we can see here on this picture that there is a huge amount of tericity so it was 500 microns of tericity um, and then the sag of between 5100 5200 so if we go on again so we can see here that the that the lens ordered was a 17 millimeter prolate and the sag of 5200. So if we go on here, this is the diagnostic lens. So the diagnostic lens, I think, has a, a sag of 5500. So you can see here a huge and excessive amount of sag, um, which is what we would have expected given that the ESP showed us that it was going to be. Um, well, we were to expect about 5,100 uh, was, was the suggested sag. And if we go on again, so here we can have a look at the diagnostic lens on the eye, and we can see here the way it's rising up above the sclera. So that 50-50 rule isn't obeyed. So what we want to do there is we definitely want to steepen that meridian. And then if we go on to the next picture, we can see that that one is digging in. So we wanted to flatten that meridian. So again, the diagnostic lens, while it will give us a good idea of 
where the two principal meridians are. We knew it was going to be off because the ESP suggested about 500 microns of tericity. So I ordered the lens based on the ESP's advice. And here we are at one month. Um, we can see here a well-aligned well lens. The patient was happy, good comfort, good wearing time. Um, so it was absolutely excellent. Um, so just in terms of in terms of my own journey through through fitting um, spare lenses, and if we just move on, Ilsa, um, it was you just need a a, a nice a system, a systematic approach. So when you put the lens on the eye, first of all, having a good look and looking for say temporal inferior decentration that will give you a good idea that the the lens or the the lens required will be tarik if you do see that and then looking at the sag making sure that the sag is is correct you're looking for probably about three to four hundred microns um sag and then expect that to to reduce by approximately 200 microns so you'd be left with a, a central clearance of between 150, 200 microns thereabouts. Making sure that the limbal area is cleared. Um, and then the thing that got me probably the most or the most, um, the, the trickiest part of fitting the sclera lenses was, was that peripheral alignment zone. So again, the ESP telling you where to look out for, where exactly you're going to, where to expect uh, impingement or, or, or blanching. So, if you look at the at the top picture there, you can see that that blanching there, the compression, um, because the lens is, is standing off, the weight of the lens isn't being spread evenly. Um, and then if you look at the bottom picture there, so that's an example of a lens that's actually quite flat fitting. If you, Ilse, say at about the two o'clock position on that, um, yeah, that blood vessel there, so you can see that blood vessel there is actually, as it's running its course, it's deflected. So that's a good indication, again, that the lens is actually flat. You have a, a bit of a prismatic effect. Um, the lens or the, the blood vessel gets def deflected. Air bubbles under the, the periphery of the lens as well is a good indication that the lens is, um, is flat fitting. There's, and if you just move on again. So, sorry, uh, Kian. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a question from Brian Brian Tompkins. He said, "Well, can you really trust the edge of the OCT fifty uh, fifty based on the the artifact that they can create with the lens material having a different uh, refraction index? Um, how much do you rely on on the on the OCT images as soon as there's an actual scale lens on the eye?" So I. I, I won't use I won't take a picture of a uh, sclera lens with the OCT and um, take it as gospel. So you have to the way I'll do it is looking at all the information available to me. So I'll get a good in the, you'll get a good idea of whether the fifty whether the the lens is really digging in or not um, with the OCT. And then obviously, which you're looking under, um, looking at the lens under white light on the slit lamp, and then you can really evaluate then if there's impingement or compression. So I suppose it's just a, a coalition or a collating all the data that you have available to you. So using your OCT, looking at the ESP, and then obviously finally you as the um, as a practitioner. Um, having a look at the lens itself and 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 evaluating it. I hope that uh, I hope that answers uh, answers your question. Um, the the final one with I suppose just last <laughs> just the last month on the scleral lens monthly. So uh, a study uh, by Melissa Barnett. So where they got. Um, practitioners who had never fit um, scleral lenses before and what they did was they gave them a diagnostic, diagnostic fitting set and they got them to fit um, a number of patients. So 
what um, what they found obviously was that the more lenses that they fit um, the the more accurate and uh, the better fitting lenses were were achieved so that's that's great with practice good practice makes perfect um but what happened was the mean number of reorders you can see here was about 1.76 um so there was per eye so there was a lot of ordering a lens having to reorder having to refine the fit and it was very very interesting that what they said was with the advent of new technologies that this could be reduced so that's where the ESP again will come in and I found it really really beneficial uh, another tool and at the end of the day as well when you when you can show the patient um, a 3d map of their eye and you're talking to them about it it really is um, there's a wow factor there you know they've they've probably been to a few other places um, uh, gone through a fitting process you know again putting lots and lots of lenses on the eyes whereas you can show them this it, it really does set you um, apart as a practitioner showing that you're you're invested in technology um, and trying to do the best for the for the patient so and finally that last that last fact there 85 percent of the lenses um, that were fit in that study ended up having to be fit with the tire periphery so that will give you an idea as well that um, you need you need the ESP there just to really help and to really make your um, your your fitting as accurate as possible. So thank you, thank you all very very much for your uh, for your attention, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to present a few more uh, cases soon in the near future. All right, thank you so much, Kian. Thank you for sharing your uh, your experience and, uh, and 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 also taking us through uh, kind of the the nuggets of uh, of fitting uh, fitting scleral lenses. Uh, big thank you also to uh, to Ilse for explaining the the background and the details. Um, um, get in touch with us. Um, you will be receiving a, a link of this uh, of this webinar in a video. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate ever to to reach out to us. It will be our pleasure to uh, to help you. And uh, we wish you uh, a very nice continuation of the evening, the afternoon, and the morning. And, uh, and hope to see you at one of our next um, webinars. Thank you so much. Bye-bye for now. See ya.